Greetings and welcome. We are uh, now interested in introducing to you some information that's introductory regarding the state standard of writing. So that's, that's where we want to be. I recommend that you have in front of you uh, the Skeleton Guide, page four. four of the day one packet, a blank sheet of paper as well for some note taking. And my objective here now is to introduce First of all, the notion of uh, how we approach writing in 303. For some of you, this will be a review. For others of you, this will be some new information. And I think for all of us, this will help us in the creating of the writing assessments that are a part of the read-write packets, OK? I want to I work two parts. First of all, I want to talk about very quickly <laughs> the approach to writing that we will often talk about in here that we will refer to as jam writing. So that will be my first observations. Secondly, we will then talk about the form of writing that we will uh, work with and manipulate here, beginning with the traditional five-paragraph essay, uh, and more particularly then identifying of internal and external validation. So I said a mouthful there, and I hope that I can break all of this down in ways that make some sense. Let's begin, first of all, by asking uh, of us, um, you know, the state standards in regards to writing. Just like reading, and therefore we have to have annotations, I have to have evidence that you actually are doing this thing we call writing, okay? Now that will happen traditionally in three ways. One, and uh, sometimes, you know, we'll do this. These are what we will simply call TP or typed papers. Now typed papers will appear as only plus points on test sheets at section number two, okay? And periodically I will give you the opportunity, call it writing practice for lack of a better phrase, all right? The second kind of writing that we'll be involved with will be sometimes what we'll refer to as timed writings. These will be writings that are done in class under timed conditions, and they often will be typed and sometimes will be handwritten. Sometimes they're, they're, they're ascribed certain kinds of actual grades. Other times they are simply going to be uh, plus points on the test sheet. The final kind of writing that we will be doing, and the one that I'll be giving now most of my focus to, our writing assessments, and these are of course the second component in the read-write packets that we will be handing in each week over the course of our year. Now, how to approach this writing? Traditionally, young writers will approach their writing uh, and they will work what we call from form to content or idea. Now, I have lectures already uh, on Learn Strong about some of this information. So if you need more intel, you can always look for it there. What do I mean by this? Well, traditionally students will be assigned, for example, to write a poem or uh, a story or an essay, and they will go home and sit down and they'll try to create uh, an essay. I've got to write an essay. I've got to write an essay tonight. They look at the screen. The screen looks back at them all kinds of frustration involved before they finally write something that in the end they are not so pleased with and yet they hit the print key nonetheless, okay? Now, I should point out that this kind of approach where we begin by some kind of form and then try to create some kind of product that we'll call the content of the idea, that is not how professional writers approach writing, not even kind of close. What professional writers do is they understand that if they can derive an idea, right, they can take that idea and turn it into any number of these kinds of pieces of writing. Stephen King doesn't sit down to write a novel. Stephen King sits down and journals and looks for ideas that will ultimately translate it in, 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 into any number of kinds of forms of writing. Okay? Having said that, we will then talk about the acquisition of ideas for our writing through what we'll call jam writing, what Peter Elbow and others call free writing. And the idea is born of a concept that there's actually what we will call the two minds of the writer, the two minds of the writer, okay? Years ago, I stumbled onto this idea by assigning pieces of writing to, uh, first of all, seventh grade students. In our early research, that's where we began, was in junior high, middle schools, and then on to high school way in the college, university students, where I would assign, for example, a topic, I don't know, your favorite animal, and students uh, I, I would begin to write. I was not at all interested in what they wrote. I just sat at the back of the room with a clipboard and we observed how they wrote. Where? They would begin writing, 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 and somewhere between the fifth and the seventh line they would stop, 
their pencil or pen would stop, their eyes would go back up to the very first thing, a line, and they would begin reading what they had written. Uh, they would find typos, they would make mistakes, they uh, uh, tear the paper out because they didn't like what they would start all over again. This, uh, this process of trying to start but not finish writing is born of an understanding of the two minds of, uh, of writers. The first is what we call the creative mind. Okay? Now this creative, or sometimes we'll refer to it as a creative voice. And this creative voice just begins to produce. All right? But somewhere between the fifth to seventh line, okay, a second voice will step in, and this is what we'll often refer to as the editor's voice, or the editor's mind. And this is a very critical voice. And it will step out of the dark shadows of the psyche and say to the creative voice, do you have any idea how crappy you are at this, at this writing thing? No, I'm serious. If you don't believe me, stop your writing, go back up and start reading the garbage that you've constructed, and I absolutely guarantee you, you will see just how bad you are at this. Of course, we should point out, the creative voice is very fragile. The editor's voice is very critical. And so the fragile creative mind can go away very quickly. We stop writing, we go back up to the top, we begin the process of trying to uh, you know, read and then of course become critically uh, analytical about what we've written. I will often say to students, you know, you can do a lot of processes with your brain, but one thing you can't do is to sit down and start writing. And so I'll give you a topic, what happened Friday night, we won't get into it. Uh, and, uh, you know, writing, writing, writing. And somewhere around the fifth line, I'm going to ask you to do something, and I just want you to do whatever I ask you to do. And then I just simply, while you're writing, I say out loud to you, now, I want you to keep writing what you did last Friday night, but I also want you to start reading out loud what you wrote on the first line. I remember giving this lecture a few years ago and a freshman actually said out loud, dude, I can do that, which I was so happy that she said that. Uh, and so I said, great, great, let's try it. And of course, we all kind of laughed at the fact that as amazing as the human mind is, these two activities, functions of the mind, are what we call mutually exclusive activities. You cannot write and read at the same time. You just can't do it. Your mind, and there's nobody on this planet that can do that little activity that I just said. Nobody. The, the, the one has to, cognitive ability has to shut down for the other one to work. Well, what most students will do is they'll start out writing and allowing the creative mind to work. And then somewhere between the, the, the fifth and the seventh line, they'll want to go back and begin to read what it is that they've written. Of course, the only problem is that by the time you finally get back to where you left off, what's happened to the idea? Gone. So... We'll try to ask you to do something that professional writers do, and that is seek out an idea through the form of jam writing. Now, we call this non-stop writing. There's a few simple rules. We'll work through them quickly. Non-stop writing. Whatever's in the brain goes on to the page. All right? Um, and underline the word whatever. Okay. Why? Because this writing is only for you. No one else will ever see it. And the idea is what you want to be able to do is to try to take what's in your brain out onto the page. Now to do this, it's got to be nonstop writing that we shoot for in the beginning stages at roughly 10 minutes and beyond. Okay? So we literally try and go for 10 minutes, which for most of us is a very, very difficult project in the early stages. It reminds us of when we were in middle school and we had to run that wretched mile. Some of you love this, so I apologize in advance. But for the rest of us that hated this project, out we go to the track. We're going to run around the stupid track. We're going to get, you know, at some point we're running and all of a sudden it occurs to you there is something wrong with your body. You know, it's like, dude, what is up? So you slow down uh, to say there's something, no, no, really there's something wrong with me, to which the PE instructor screams, keep going. And so, you know, you're running a little bit more, and now it even more occurs to you, dude, I'm going to fall down on this track and asphyxiate all over myself and die, and my friends are going to be standing around going, bummer, uh, you know, and, uh, and so I have to stop. No, no, the principal, uh, the, uh, the uh, PE teacher screams, keep going. Uh, now, for those of you 
who learn to keep going, inside, inside hit here, for those of you who learn to keep going, runners will in fact talk about what they often refer to as a wall, a second wind will come on the other side of that wall, and we know that really gifted runners have the ability to very quickly get to that wall, get through that wall, and as long as they have proper nutrition and fluids in their body, dude, they can run a long, long time. Uh, writing is much the same way. At right about minute 10, we know that it gets really difficult to keep going. So, I mean, uh, the, the, the editor voice becomes really strong and it's going to say, you're, look, you're done. You need to just shut her down. If you can push through that wall and get to the other side, all of a sudden we will have what we call discovery writing. Now, what do we mean by this? I write, one great writer put it this way, I write not because I know what it is I have to say, I write to find out what it is I get to say. Discovery right. Where? You begin to kind of surprise yourself. So, some of our rules with this nonstop writing. We do not, we do not worry about mistakes. We don't, we don't uh, uh, pick our uh, pen up and go back and start making corrections. If you're typing, for example, one of the ways we like to teach this is you turn your screen off and just type. Dude, I can't do that. That's impossible for me to do that. I have to see what I'm writing. Really, why is that? Because your editor voice is so strong that you want to be able to read what you've written. Dude, if it's for nobody but you, who cares? Just, just type. Type for 10 minutes and then go back and take a look at it. You will immediately identify, if you're a typer, how often you reach up with that right pinky to hit that delete button. You're doing it all the time. You're constantly trying to monitor because you want it to be right. The point we're wanting to make with jam writing is there's no such thing as wrong or right. There's only the ideas. And you want to try to try and find ideas that are new, that can lead you to, to um, you know, some possible concepts. Once you have these ideas, it's not that hard to turn them into any number of forms of writing. All right? Questions, concepts. All right, in your notes now, let's turn and let's talk about that form. Go ahead and take out your skeleton guide if you don't have it out. And let's talk real quickly through when it finally comes time for you to actually write something that you're going to have an audience for. And that's the key. Jam writing, the only audience is you. And about this jam writing, I would say the following as well. Make sure that you understand who potentially could see it. So, for example, a senior lit course, we're doing Hamlet, the famous to be or not to be soliloquy. We do a jam session that day at the end. Of course, the to be or not to be soliloquy is Hamlet's musing, to be or not to be, <coughs> on whether to commit suicide or not. For those of you that don't know this play, we soon will study. Well, young lady goes out, hangs out with her people, comes back at about 10. There's police all over the front of her house. She walks in the door. Her mother screams, oh, thank heavens you're alive, to which she is like, what is going on? Then she looks over her mother's shoulder to her three-ring notebook that's sitting on the coffee table. She left it there. Her mother decided to do a little mother snooping. She found her jam writing section of her notebook and read the entry of the day where she was musing on the possibility of taking her life just like Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy. It was all practice writing. There was no seriousness in it at all. Be careful, in other words, what you do with jam writing. If you feel that you fear potential self-disclosure from this kind of writing, do it and then destroy it in some way. I mean, that's another way to, that's another way to, to uh, you know, burn it or throw it away or, you know, delete it or whatever. Once you've got jam writing, you can go back and begin to study what kinds of ideas you're working with that can help you to generate potential papers. Now, let's talk about the form of the paper, okay? Now, I want to start, first of all, by just pointing out a couple of the basics. In terms of the login information. You always want to provide for the instructor or the prof some basic intel that usually appears in the top right corner of your page. Always your name, always what the topic, uh, uh, the, the, um, the assignment is, in our case read write packets, and then always the number, the date when the packet is due, right, all of that is there. And if there's any kind of an assignment that's a part of this, always put that. So, for example, if there's a page number associated, if there's a St. Martin's Guide chapter or whatever, for example, you will put that intel right up there at the login information. Then, I'm reading right off your skeleton guide now, you're going to skip a couple of lines, and you're going to begin your essay with two 
titles. Okay? The first title we will constitute as a creative title. Underline the word creative. Or if you're working with your skeleton guide, circle with red ink the word creative. That's the whole idea. You want to work with something that will give the reader, namely the instructor, some kind of you know interest in the paper. Now, let's point out something right away for your notes before we go any further. <coughs> when we are doing this kind of writing for an instructor, please don't take this the wrong way. But university college profs do not sit down with a stack of 15 or 20 papers that they have to score and go, yes, I get to read 20 papers on Hamlet the play. I'm so excited, maybe I'll learn some new things. No, no. Now, I'm not saying profs and instructors can't learn new things from students. Often we do. But that's not why you write. We are, for your notes, you need to write this down. We are playing a compositional game, underline the word game. There are rules to the game. Once you know these rules, you can manipulate and use these rules. What are the fundamental rules? We usually are working with some text or idea of, or collection of texts, presentation of ideas, if it's a history class, a psych class, whatever. Then the instructor will assign a topic about which you are to write. That topic sometimes is directly given to you. Please write on the three causes of the American Civil War, if I'm a history instructor. Or sometimes it will just simply be, you have a paper in seven weeks, write a paper on any topic of your choosing. Okay, So it can be either direction. Okay. Then you sit down and you write a paper. Usually it's typed, almost always, unless it's some in-class project where you are going to show the instructor, see, I know how to play the game. Now the playing of the game immediately has to do with the way the paper looks on the page, right? So right away there's certain kind of giveaways that let us know this is a formal essay, that is to say an academic essay, okay? The first thing will always that will be the giveaway will be a title of some kind, in our case two titles. The first is that creative title. The second more important sits right beneath the creative title in parenthetics for our papers. And we call this the academic title. Now the academic title will always begin with the same formulation. It's boring. It's intentionally boring. If the creative title is creative, the academic title is intentionally boring. Where we will use language like a discussion of, or an analysis of, or a treatment of. Let's say, for example, I've given you to write a topic to write on three important types of violence in the Troy tale. Okay, let's just say that I've assigned this to you. And in this, uh, in this assignment, then, you will have a creative title. I don't know, War Stakes or something like that. And then you're going to have a cre and then you're going to have an academic title, an analysis of three types of violence from the Troy tale. Okay. So the academic title, and this is important for your notes, the academic title always tells us what the thesis of the paper will actually be about. Okay. Now a couple of other logistics here. You're always typing your papers. We ask that you work with uh, um, double spacing of your papers. We always ask that you are working with 10 point Times New Roman. These are the, these are the font sizes uh, that allow for us to get the most words on the page. Dude, nobody cares about your paper's length. We passed that, we passed that benchmark back in eighth grade. Okay? It is un, it, it's kind of an, uh, an understood that an academic essay is built it, by paragraphing. Okay? We know for sure we're going to have five of these paragraphs. These paragraphs are constituted as five to seven sentence projects. You might write that down. Five to seven sentence projects. Okay? With that in mind, right, these papers are always going to be a couple of pages long. All right? Always going to be a couple of pages long. Now, as we become seniors, we begin to challenge ourselves in, for example, a 1010 class. We obviously are looking to make these papers even longer as we become very serious about uh, you know, our, our, our creating of, of an academic essay. In its simplest terms, and this is the point of the skeleton guide, in its simplest terms now, a formal essay will constitute five paragraphs where the first paragraph will be what we constitute or call the introduction or the intro paragraph. Several important things happen there. Okay? So we'll begin with paragraph number one, an intro. Okay? 
we then will constitute the next three paragraphs, paragraphs two, three, and four, as what we will call points of validation. To validate means to prove, okay? That word is an important word for us. POVs one, two, and three. Finally, paragraph number five is what we will constitute as the conclusion, all right? Now, what I'd like to do uh, real quickly now is to just kind of walk through this for us, okay? If you have any kinds of questions or concerns about the intel as I'm presenting it, go ahead and hit us up at the end of the hour. Maybe I'll have answered it by then. First of all, to the introduction. There's several things that key happen there. The first and most important is the first sentence of your essay is not your thesis. If you've been asked to write on three, cause, uh, three types of violence in uh, the Troy tale, your first line of your essay will not be, there are three types of violence in the Troy tale, okay? No, no, no. That sentence is what we would call a thesis, and we will reserve the placement of that sentence to the very last sentence of an intro paragraph. We're going to have several things, however, we will do. They are listed for you right there on the skeleton guide. Scan them as we work through them. Depending on the kind of essay you're writing, the intro paragraph will always provide us with the title of the text that we'll be re referring to, a brief summary of that text that we'll be referring to, defining any special kinds of words that we might uh, be using in the essay. If I ask you, for example, to write on irony, you'll want to define irony. Whoa, 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 dude, you asked me to write on irony. Obviously, you know what irony is. Why would I need to define it? Because we're playing a game where you're telling me, A, I understand I'm being asked to uh, write on irony, and B, I need to show you that I know what irony is. It's a game that's being played. We want to be sure and play the game well. Finally. Our last sentence of our first paragraph will be what we call our thesis sentence, and this will event some notion of what we will call the A to B paradigm. Now you need to listen to this carefully. From here on out, I assume that you understand this concept. If you need more elucidation, you need to stop in for another meeting, okay? All thesis writing and academic writing is relational. You need to write that down. All academic writing is relational in its thesis composition development. What do we mean by that? We mean that we will always be relating one idea, what we'll simply call A, to another idea, what we will call B. Okay? Let's use a classic example, three types of violence from the Troy tale. Notice, if I assign, discuss three kinds of violence from the Troy tale, I am not asking you to write a book report about the Troy tale. No, 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 no. We're not, that, that is the text from which we're working, but I'm not asking you whether you like the Troy tale or not. The Troy tale is a great story. No, 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 no. We're not interested in your opinions about the Troy tale. We're interested in you responding to the Troy tale. We'll qualify A in this regards as the text. Right? And that is to say the Troy tale in our, in our example. But I'm not just asking you to summarize the Troy tale. The Troy tale is a story of blah, 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 blah. First this happens, then this No, 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 that's not this essay. We're always writing relationally. Notice our B here is three types of violence. Right? So that's what we're writing on. Okay? And therefore our thesis will be very focused with a relationship of some kind or another. All right. Now, why is that important? Because in our essay, we will for sure always have three points of validation. Let me just pause and make a 10-10 observation here. When we start learning how to write in the high school level, it's very much like learning how to play music. So, if you pick up an instrument for the first time, you have to do this na 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 Na, 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 na. Some of you are familiar with this, this scale work over and over again. Na, 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 na. We got to do that. At some point, however, you're going to take that scale work and you're going to move beyond it to begin to play what? I don't know, depending, Michael, row your boat ashore and some other kind of wretched little songs, which will ultimately then lead to some kind of more mature composition, right? In composition writing, in academic writing, the scale work for us culminates in the five paragraph essay. As we mature as writers though, when I say POV1, POV2, POV3, I can be talking about more than one paragraph 
for a point of validation. It might very well be the case that we will use two, three, even four paragraphs to constitute a point of validation. But nonetheless, foundational to understanding the skeleton guide and the work we do in here, every paragraph must have a topic sentence. I'll just say TS, topic sentence. Now we always want that topic sentence to be the first sentence of body paragraphs. And here's why. Instructors will do what we call scans of your essay. Okay? I've even explained it to you in the form of levels of reading for me. A first scan of the essay can take all of about a second and a half and it is fundamental form. If I don't see at least two titles and five indentions, I know I'm not looking at a paper much over 50 points. Okay? Why? Because the paper doesn't in any way conform to our skeleton guide. Got me? Okay. Right away, I know that. A second sweep of the paper, however, will begin to identify four key sentences, which of course you will be placing on your cover sheet at the bottom. That is to say, your thesis and your three at least topic POV sentences. Why is the A to B paradigm so important in the thesis? Are you ready for this? Because your topic sentences must mirror your thesis. I'll say this again, it's so crucial. Your topic sentences must mirror your thesis. In other words, for each POV, POV1, POV2, POV3, there must be some element of your A and some element of your B. Got me? Now, in its most simplistic presentation of, uh, of uh, validation, young, really young writers will often do this, there are three kinds of violence in the Troy tale thesis. The first kind of violence in the Troy tale is POV1. The second kind of violence in the Troy tale is POV2. The third kind of violence in the Troy, right? In other words, they're technically, let's point out, what they are doing is absolutely right, okay? But there's a stylistic problem, isn't there, right? I mean, we're not being very creative in the presentation of our topic sentences and POVs. Got me? What we really want to do is we want to pay attention to some element of our A, for example, one type of violence, let's just call it psychological, right? And then one element of our B, let's not say the Troy tale, but let's find one specific moment. So for example, psychological violence is pervasive in the story of the Troy tale as best evidenced by the removal of, weapon, of, of armor by slain soldiers and the pulling of dead bodies around uh, uh, to humiliate the, the opponent, right, or the enemy. Notice what I've done in that topic sentence. I have some element of my A, some mentioning of the Troy tale, some element of my B, some kind of violence that will be a product of, of the uh, Troy tale. Namely, I've characterized it as psychological violence. Then, in that paragraph or paragraphs, I will then treat specifically that point of validation. I will validate using two kinds of validation. Two kinds. One, internal validation. Internal validation. Okay. Now what is that? References and quotes directly to or from an assigned text or text <coughs> that I've mentioned in my intro paragraph, in this case the Troy Tale. If I'm writing on the Troy Tale, I'll probably reference Edith Hamilton's mythology, won't I? I'll probably reference Homer's Iliad Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid, depending on my knowledge base, what I've been studying, etc. Right? Okay. So I'm going to provide direct quotes. If I provide direct quotes from the text, I'm going to put quotation marks around it. Or I can summarize, right, in my own words, and yet still I'm referencing the text. Okay? Now we will call this internal validation or labeled as IV. For sure, that's our nomenclature in 303, IV. The second kind of validation is what we call external validation, and we'll reference this as EV. Okay. EV. External validation, anytime I go to a source outside of the assigned text or texts, right? I find some information on a database, I read it out of another book or a magazine. And I then provide that information in my essay in the form of a, now I'll use an important word, citation. To cite, C-I-T-E, 
means to provide the information, right, in the body of the text and outside at the end of the body of the text, all right? So let's talk through that real quickly. So we're now talking about methods of citation and the MLA style book, okay? Methods of citation and the MLA style book. There are rules in regards to citation. Here's the deal. If I provide information in my paper, but I don't tell where it comes from, I have committed the egregious act of plagiarism. Now I will tell you, this act of plagiarism is increasingly becoming a big dog deal within the academic community of the university. Students are being thrown out of schools. Students are being cr given criminal records for plagiarizing. Okay? A, a classic documented case of this happened just a year or two ago in Pepperdine in Malibu where a student misquoted one quote in a 17-page paper and she was brought in front of the committee it was demonstrated that she did it intentionally uh, and she was asked to leave the school and given a criminal record on top of it. So I'm not messing around when I say there is a reason why schools are now using software like Paper Raider and Turnitin.com and others to try to make sure students are not committing this plagiarism project. Now here's the deal. You want to do the research as you write your paper. So allow for this box to be what we would call in-text citation. And then this box would be what we call end text citation or works cited, okay? This is your reference page. We don't call it a bibliography, okay? It's your works cited reference page. In the body of the paper you're writing, 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 when it comes time for you to make a citation, you have one of two ways you can do this, okay? A primary citation is simply to quote directly. We will know it's a direct quote because you use quotation marks. Okay? A secondary form of external validation or citation is to simply summarize in some way something that you found outside of the, uh, of the primary text that you're studying from or you're referencing. Okay. Either way, you must provide basic information in the body of the paper. Okay? And here we're talking now the MLA style book, all right? The MLA style book, Modern Language Association style book. We always will provide the author's last name, okay? That is crucial. That is crucial because the author's last name will appear on the works cited page, right? that will be a fundamental part of your paper. All right? Whether you are providing a direct quote or a secondary quote of a paraphrase, summary, you still must say where the information came from. Okay? That last name then will correlate with the work cited that's listed on the last page of your paper. Okay? Now, I say your paper, not your packet. Remember, your packet will always have two final pages, correct? The first page and the last page of Paper Raider. Got me? But the last page of your paper will always be a printed paper document that looks kind of like this. Alphabetical order, last name first, all ensuing lines of an entry are indented, allowing for the author's last names to set out. Okay? Identifiable. It is this simple. Listen carefully. If you are going to quote in the body of your paper, you need to give enough information on the works cited page so that the instructor can go and find that quote wherever you got it from. We always work with author's names. Important observation. If you are working with a citation that does not have an author's name, it must have an organization that's notably attached to it. For example, you can go to the NASA website and quote from that site, right? But what you cannot do is just find information on the web and simply present that in your paper, okay, without an author's name. This is crucial, and you want to make sure you pay close attention to this. 
You always want to be very critical of your source work, which is why we always recommend you not work in Google, but rather in maybe Google Scholar and or the databases that, you know, Ms. Overcast, our librarian, or whoever will talk about. All right? Finally, your conclusion paragraph will be your restatement summarizing a thesis and points of validation. You hit the print key. When you get ready to hand your paper in to me, you're not finished yet. You're going to take out a red ink pen and you're going to identify some key pieces of information for us so that very clearly we can be sure that you are doing your job, fundamental job of learning how to write these papers. With red ink, the first thing you're going to identify over your thesis, you will identify the A and the B over each of your thesis and topic sentences. Now you're going to do this in the paper, you're not going to do this on your cover sheet. Okay? Then, down the left hand side of your page, every time there is an example of internal validation where you quote from an actual text, you're simply going to mark it in the margin as IV, internal validation. Down the right hand side of the page, right, you're going to be working with external validation, EV. But there's going to be one other important element here. On the reference page, again, this is done with red ink so that you don't confuse what you're doing with the MLA style book. It's not. It's what work we're doing. You will literally number your five required pieces of external validation down the left-hand side on the works cited page with red ink. One through five. In the body of the paper, then, when you use, let's say for example, your first external validation quote comes from source number three, you will write EV and then you'll write the number three right next to it. Got me? This will allow you to be sure that if you have five pieces of, of uh, references listed on the external validation works cited page, all five of those have to be cited in the body of your paper. Okay? So from this point on now, Anytime you're handing in a paper for me, you want to be sure that you are demonstrating with red ink your pieces of internal and external validation. Now, if I have an assigned external validation, you don't have to do it. But it is an unspoken assertion that you must be working with internal validation. So, for example, if you're writing on the three types of violence from the Troy tale, you're clearly quoting from Edith Hamilton's mythology in part four, right? You're providing quotes, either direct or indirect. And when you do that, you're fu you're, you've got to provide us with that IV in the left-hand margin above each one of your topic sentences, A and B, to identify that you're aware that you're actually showing this relationship between your thesis and your topic sentences. All right? Finally, you've got to begin the process of stronger editing of your papers. Paper Raider can help. You are not obligated to just submit once the paper reader. You can submit over and over again until you start to get higher scores, especially on the vocab side, right? And you want to pay close attention to the plagiarism score as well. If you're getting anything below a, a, a 90 on your plagiarism score, you want to go back and pay close attention as to why. So that finally when you submit to paper reader, you feel confident about that score as you get ready to hand your paper in. Editing and revision will be the real focus for us this year. And so you want to find people who can find the errors as you get ready to start thinking about handing papers in. I've given a lecture on grammar and editing. I recommend that you take a look at it on Learn Strong. It will help you to maybe go through a little review before you start the process of uh, you know, writing these papers.